So the security of emails and sending emails has been discussed a lot lately. It's no secret that services, especially like Gmail, um, are quite privacy invasive. We know that like all other Google services, Gmail is using your data for advertising purposes in order to tie more data to your identity. Besides the privacy invasive use of data, a lot of people are also concerned about if these companies are able to read your emails, if they're able to see who you send them to, and other concerns. Now, there's been a lot of other YouTubers that have discussed alternatives such as ProtonMail and Tutanota as an alternative to using Gmail. So not only are they not collecting your data in the same way that Google is, but they also claim to be encrypted. Now, YouTubers such as The Hated One have discussed uh, the encryption of ProtonMail in detail, much more detail than I could ever do. So I suggest that you check out his video if you're interested, but there are some limitations to their encryption. So for example, it's a lot more secure on the ProtonMail app itself as users can check the binary and confirm that this application is produced from ProtonMail. That can't be done on the web application like this. There's also a concern with the encryption that they use in general. So essentially any service where the company themselves control your encryption keys, you should always be a bit cautious about. Even if you trust that company, there's no real guarantee that your emails are going to be encrypted. Now, the best way around this is PGP, but we'll discuss that a little later in the video. So before I actually get into the details of why email isn't as secure and what you should look out for, you should probably note that the email protocols such as SNMP, um, ICMP, um, they're quite old and even Pop3, which isn't even used anymore. They weren't really designed for security in mind in the same way a lot of other protocols we use are. And the truth is, if you can avoid it, there are numerous other messaging applications and protocols that are just better in every way, that are more private, they're more secure, and, well, they're quicker as well. I've made videos in the past about XMPP and how you can set up your own server in the past, um, so I suggest that you check that out if you're interested. Because oftentimes, I mean, who even uses email anymore for communicating and social means? So before we get started on some general suggestions for securing your email, we should discuss threat models and why there are some limitations towards usability versus security. So you have to ask yourself, why are you concerned about security or privacy with your emails? Is it because you just don't want Google and other large tech companies to use invasive practices with your data? Or are you trying to hide from some larger adversaries, such as the government or whatever? If that is the case, then you have uh, bigger problems than this video can really handle. So your best bet is to really start to research into much more secure and private email services, ones that you can set up over Tor, for example. Or maybe you should just consider just not using email at all. For the vast majority of people, we just want our data to be secure and to not have to worry about people looking at our emails. And so there's three things I want you to keep in mind. It has a nice little abbreviation, which is CIA, which is very, uh, very fitting. This stands for confidentiality, integrity, and anonymity. Now, this should not be confused with CI, which is another abbreviation used in security, which stands for confidentiality, integrity, and authenticity. Um, they're quite related, but not quite the same. So confidentiality just means that you want your messages to be confidential. You do not want people to be spying on your messages. You only want intended parties to be able to read them. Integrity means that we do not want our messages to be altered or changed in any way when they are received by the recipient. And anonymity is pretty clear. Uh, we want to remain anonymous if possible. This isn't always the case. Um, obviously, if you have a public email address, then people are just going to be able to tie that to your identity. But for certain cases, this could be useful. So for example, if you have a throwaway account, you don't really want that to be linked to your private identity. Same if you're buying things online or if you're just applying to applications online. And so something to consider is it's not always possible to get all three of these factors in mind when you're choosing an email service. In fact, it's nearly always impossible. So something to consider is with ProtonMail, 
you actually have to use a mobile or a previous email address when you're signing up to the account. So although their service is very good, I use ProtonMail a lot, um, this essentially just rules out anonymity straight away. Now, as we get into it, this may not be an issue for certain circumstances, but one thing I will just say is I believe that Tutanota, which is another great service that is uh, very privacy respecting, very secure, um, I don't believe that they ask for these things when you sign up for an account. And like ProtonMail, they have an onion address, so you can sign up over Tor if you want. So the first thing I'm going to suggest just straight off the bat is that is you need to consider why you're using email in the first place. What you'll find is that there's a load of different reasons why you would use email. So first off, if people want to contact you, if you want to sign up for certain online services, if you want to buy things online, there are various reasons why we might use email in the first place. And for most of these reasons, we will probably have a different threat model and we'll probably have to factor in confidentiality, integrity, and anonymity in a different way. So what do I mean by that? I have a public email address. It's owen at biasedriot.co. It's running on my own private email server. So although I have complete access to my data, I know that no one else has access to my server. Since it is tied to my actual identity, it's quite difficult to actually go about this in an anonymous way. And to be honest, there's no real reason to. If you have a personal email account that you want people to email you and who know you in real life, then there's no real reason to go about uh, focusing on an anonymity when you're using that. Let's take another thing, for example, so social media. I've made videos in the past and why we should probably try to get away from social media as much as possible. But this is a case where our threat model might change a bit. We might sign up for social media, but we don't necessarily want Facebook or Twitter knowing who our actual identity is. So that the numerous amounts of data that they collect on you isn't necessarily tied to your physical identity. Another example is buying things online. So although social media is bad, an even worse competitor when it comes to invasive privacy practices is services like Amazon and other online e-commerce sites. Oftentimes, these services know much more about you than you know about yourself. And so it can always be useful to not only remain a little more anonymous and not have this data tied to your physical identity, but to just give them no slack at all. And what I mean by that is to use a burner account, for example. And so here's where my advice really comes from. Depending on your use, it's probably going to be good to separate your emails into different accounts. So for your personal email account, there's no real way of getting around this. This is going to be tied to your physical identity in some way. So for this, normally I have set up my own email server. This isn't always possible for other people. But having a domain and a server that you buy every month is something that's not only tied to your physical identity, but it's also tied to your bank account. Now, if you don't want to set up your own private email server, that's fair enough. I have a video on how you can do that, by the way. It's called um, setting up a cloud server. You can check it out on my channel. But if you don't want to, then your best bet is to use Tutanota or some other service like ProtonMail um, in order to just create an email account for yourself. The second thing is to separate your social media accounts. So again, if you have a personal uh, Facebook page, for example, or whatever, uh, this is going to be tied to your identity in some way. But it's good both from a spam perspective and from a privacy perspective to separate this from your private email. Now, the third one is for general online buying and other miscellaneous services. Now, here's something that I'm going to recommend, which a lot of people might not agree with, but your best bet is to just use burner accounts. Every time I delete it, I basically just use a different email address because one, uh, I don't want that spam and those suggestions keep popping up in my email address. So although Amazon gathers a lot of information about your spending habits, it's good that they are not able to tie that to other things such as other services you use 
because they can gain just much more data and much more information about your page. Now, although using uh, burner emails is a good idea, one thing I will suggest is to try using email aliasing. So aliasing is essentially when you have a when you have a single email account and you create other aliases on top of that. So for example, if you have a domain such as biasright.co, for example, I have multiple aliases. I have a contact, I have a personal one, which is my Owen at biasright.co. I might have another one for, I don't know, say if I want to sign up for uh, Facebook, for example, I might have Facebook at biasright.co. I don't have a Facebook account, by the way, for um, that. Well, that specific account doesn't exist anyway. Don't try to look it up. What you can do is you can keep record of all of these services and all these email addresses while separating them. So no single service can tie your online spending behavior to other services. One good solution to this is to use simple login. Um, another pe I know a few people have recommended this in the past as well. I believe Mailbird is another one that does aliasing services. And if you set up an email server, which again, I have a tutorial on how you can do that online. This is actually very simple. It's just like adding a word to a certain file and you can just create another alias. So this is just a little extra thing. Um, I figured I'd mention it because uh, some of you will have your own email servers and you will be using services like uh, ProtonMail or Tutanota. It's good to generate a PGP key. So PGP is an asymmetric encryption protocol. It's a public key encryption. Um, I've mentioned how to do this in a previous video before, I think, but essentially um, you have a private key that you use for encrypting your data. So you give out your public key to anyone who wants it. Um, they use your, pri your public key in order to decrypt the messages that you encrypt with your private key. So when we think about confidentiality and integrity, this essentially covers both of them. So I looked up a diagram to kind of show this a bit better. In terms of confidentiality, we only want certain people to be able to see our messages. And so this is done by encrypting our messages with our private key. Now there's another practice called signing, which is good for integrity. So when you sign a message, what you essentially do is ensure that only a certain person can view the email. So this is done by using the other person's public key. Now, there are various ways that you can create a PGP key, but the most common one for people who use Linux is just using GPG. So just real quick, I'm gonna show you how you can generate a GPG key and how you can use it to sign an email. The first thing you're gonna to need to do is to install a GPG, which is the GNU PG package. Install new pg okay so it turns out i already had it installed which is good so the next thing you're going to want to do is run gpg key gen I believe it actually i believe it's gen key and so this is going to ask you for a load of different details i'm just going to put in owen that's my real name are you serious so it's going to ask for an email address. It's going to be email address tied to your GPG key. So whatever one that you're going to be sending out emails in, you can use that. I'm going to use Owen at biasedriot.co. I'm going to press OK. And it's going to ask you for a passphrase. So I'm just going to put one in quick. I'm probably going to delete this afterwards. And so it's going to use entropy in order to generate it. So just move your mouse around and whatever. Okay, so it just created a um, private and public key. So one thing I will say is that when you generate a, a GPG key, it's good to generate a revoke certificate. It's good to use a revoke certificate. So essentially, if you lose your uh, GPG key or whatever, or something goes wrong, uh, or someone else steals it or whatever, it's good to have another certificate that you keep in a different environment that you can use to essentially just revoke it so that it can't be used anymore. I'm going to do the output as just, I don't know, just somewhere here. And I'm going to create, use gen revoke for the revoke certificate, and then I'm gonna put in the same email address as before, Owen at 
biased riot.co so once you have your revocation certificate um your best bet is to just store that uh, somewhere else so store it on your local computer on a usb stick for example uh, or whatever just some other environment besides where you normally use your uh, gpg key so when you're using this um if you want to use it locally so say for for example i'm not going to go into it because i have emails on it obviously that i don't want people seeing but when you want to sign an email using mush um if, you, if you're not familiar with Mutt, for example it's a very minimal uh email client that can be used from the command line it's very good i would recommend it and um, but there's basically just an option of signing it using a pgb key you can sign it and you can encrypt it if you want so which is the best for both confidentiality and integrity uh, if you use something like protomail or tutanota um, it you're able to actually import your key onto the web app or using their application itself and so yeah whenever you are sending emails especially on the account that's actually tied to your public identity then your best bet is to use GPG or PGP, should I say, because it is just the best and most used form of encryption. Um, it's been around for a long time. It's trusted um, and it's widely used by everyone. So yeah, that combined with separating your emails into different accounts is just the best practice that you can do to ensure that not only is your data not going to be used by private tech companies, but also that you have some integrity in your messages that no one is actually going to be able to look into them. But yeah, in summary, that's the best way to go about it. Uh, email is a terrible protocol anyway, like the SNMP and ICMP. They're not good protocols for security. So if you do want privacy and security, uh, just use XNMPP for sending messages to people. But yeah, until then, I'll see you next time.